Hi, I'm Janet Hogan, creator and founder of the Fifth Door Program, and I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here with you today to give you my take on the shadow and how an unresolved shadow self might be uh, showing up in your life. So I'm just going to share with you uh, some slides and in particular, the main problem that I see playing over and over again with most people that I work with, in fact, probably as high as 80 to 90%. What is this one problem I see over and over again and basically can be summed up in one word and that word is inaction. Why is it that so many of us, even when we have an idea of our path ahead, uh, feel like we've got one foot on the accelerator and one on the brake? What is that thing that's keeping us stuck? Mostly, uh, we just go to top line symptoms and we tend to blame those. So typically, if you're feeling stuck, um, isolated, demotivated, uh, what will happen is that we'll tend to blame the most obvious symptoms. So for a lot of us, that comes down to stress. So we go, oh, well, I'm feeling too stressed. I've got too much on, right, uh, to even think about that. And we stay in this, this state of freeze. Uh, sometimes it can show up as anxiety, so you can even feel it, you know, like an uncomfortable pit in your stomach. And in that, in that space, it's very hard to think clearly, let alone make decisions. And when you can't make decisions, of course, you can't take action. So again, we're in this state of uh, either uh, freeze or flight. If we leave this go on for long enough, it manifests as depression. Uh, it almost becomes like a chronic mood state that we find ourselves in. Then it's even harder to get out of that. And we might also find it uh, popping up as symptoms like insomnia, where we start to uh, lose sleep. And in that state where we're not losing sleep, we simply don't have the energy to push through and take the action that we need to take. Um, we can also uh, self-medicate, not through, uh, uh, and I'm not talking here necessarily about, you know, chemical addiction or alcohol, although they're obvious. And we see a lot of people in this crisis mode uh, having a few drinks after work, something that they, they used never to do. Uh, but even more common cases of addiction, like uh, losing yourself in work, you know, thinking that busyness is uh, addressing the problem when all you're doing actually is filling what's really more of an inner void. Um, and then if we allow this to really play out, we can, it can go all the way. It can put strains on relationships to the point where they break down. Uh, we can see physical symptoms start to manifest, you know, pain, high blood pressure, diabetes, the list goes on and on. So uh, what we have to understand though, is that the root cause of all of this goes way, way deeper than the physical symptom. In fact, you know, one thing that we all know is that the problem in all of us, and this is common to, to everyone, everyone on this planet, uh, we don't escape childhood scot-free. In fact, for all of us, there's something that happens, some kind of shock event, moment even, um, that uh, changed something fundamental inside of us. It challenged our sense of safety. Effectively, we put our safety in the hands of others and there was a moment where uh, that feeling of, you know, being cocooned in our safe little world, remembering we came out of a womb where we were very, very safe uh, in this uh, brave new world that we found ourselves in, typically between the ages of zero and seven, something happened like a shock. And how we, and that's commonly referred to as trauma. And how we uh, know it's a trauma is because it elicited uh, some kind of emotional response where for whatever reason, we felt that we weren't good enough because we felt shame, guilt, a uh, sense of not being wanted, isolation, loneliness, uh, some kind of negative response that felt very painful. Now, how do we know that uh, this is uh, what happened in our past? Because um, as I mentioned, it shows up as external symptoms, you know. So here are some typical ones, uh, financial loss. A lot of people would be going through that at the moment. Divorce, illness, stress, anxiety. So they're the negative outcomes. So the question uh, that I asked myself when I saw this problem of inaction um, happening with people that I was taking through programs and I was thinking to myself, well, what's the point of helping people become clear on their life path if they're then not going to take the requisite action. What's behind that? And I realized that behind all these uh, physical symptoms is the one thing, which is fear. 
you know, oh, I don't think I'll be able to do it. You know, the feelings of self-doubt, uh, fear of change, uh, fear of our potential. There are so many different types of fear. But then that then led to the question, well, what sits behind the fear? What's that all about? So it felt like there was a missing link between um, what happened to us in our childhood and then the fear that affects so many of us in our adulthood. And I felt if I can identify what this is, uh, then um, I can crack the code for the fear that's stopping us taking the action and in turn free people up so that essentially, literally, they go from freeze to freedom. So how to do that? So uh, I did lots of research and what I uh, discovered was that, yes, we do overthink. In fact, we think to the degree where we might be, uh, there might be as many as 12 to 60,000 thoughts circulating between our ears every day. Now, uh, what's more astounding uh, even than that statistic is the percentage of, of those thoughts that are negative, um, yeah, just like um, Bert's face there. He's not happy, right? Okay, and that's how most of us are in a state of concern, anxiety, distress, fear, uh, when we're thinking. So what percentage of those thoughts are negative? Well, as many as, as much as 80%. And what's even more astounding is that of that 80%, 95% are repeating the same thought or one of its offspring. So <laughs> what that led me to, to uh, really work towards is what is the one thought that's sitting at the bottom of each of us and it's a different thought for every one of us that's uh, creating these tens of thousands of negative thoughts because it's this whole raft of negative thoughts that is lying behind our inability to take action. So we have to find out what that thought is. And why did I, uh, why did I feel so passionately about this? Well, because of how it played out in my own life. So let me share with you what I call the crazy loop. And I'll, I'll um, take you through my story. And as I do that, see how you relate to this because we all fall into this crazy loop, I believe. I see this over and over again and I've, I've worked with hundreds of people on this. So here's how it begins. So at that tender age, um, say between zero and seven, typically something happens to us uh, that feels like a crime. It can be something tiny, okay? It can be just a dark look from a parent, you know, a bullying older sibling. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but to a child it's huge. Anyway, for me, when I was four years old, uh, the crime uh, that I recall was my parents coming home with this little bundle that turned out to be my little sister. Now, up to that point, I'd been this overindulged, precious only child. But in that single moment, I just remember seeing my parents crossing the room. And um, as they did, all the eyes in the room went from me to my parents uh, and this precious little bundle. And to make it even worse, she had chronic colic. So she was screaming her lungs out all the time to the point where my mum practically went crazy. She turned on the lawnmower to drown out the sound. So clearly I thought, you know, this is a problem that has to be solved. I thought that they bought my sister from a shop. So next time uh, we went shopping to a department store, I peeled off the stickers off all the appliances, the price stickers and stuck them on my sister's forehead hoping that someone would buy her back. Now, when we got home, my mum was furious. You know, I remember she was yelling, you naughty, naughty girl. Now, as she did that and she was screaming at me, what happened to me? Well, I was overcome with a negative emotion. So she pulled out the wooden spoon. Uh, you know, I got a smack and then I was sent to my room and I was overcome by this sense of emotion, but I didn't know uh, what it was and I was too young to process it. So what happens, and this is what I, I realise, and this is the missing piece, that because we're so little, we can't process the emotion. So this is where our shadow self comes in. And our shadow self creates a story, which I've given a name to. I call it a core destructive belief. And this core destructive belief is a story that we believe is true because as children, we take the blame. We don't blame uh, our, our elders, that's too scary. So we, we take the blame on the, we, we believe that, you know, we're the cause of the problem, that, that it's our fault. And so the shadow, what the shadow does is create a belief, if you like, 
that helps to camouflage the emotion, to take the pain out of the emotion. So uh, my core destructive belief was I'm a naughty girl. And it simply came from like that mental tattoo that, that uh, was imprinted on in me, in my being, if you like, hardwired, that came from my mum constantly yelling at me, you naughty, naughty girl. You know, dad would say, oh, you know, how's Janet been today? And mum would say, oh, she's been very naughty. You know, so this became like my personal brand. Now, why is, why is this so? Because the next time, uh, you know, I would get into trouble, my unconscious self would be saying, yeah, but what do you expect? I'm naughty, right? So, so the pain feels less sharp. But the problem is every time this core destructive belief is triggered, it creates a fear response. And this becomes our core fear. So my core fear was getting into trouble. Why was that a core fear? Because if I kept getting into trouble, I might get rejected by my tribe, you know, and fear of rejection is a, is a primal fear. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> we don't want to be branded as naughty. So another part of us, which, which is the shadow's positive twin comes in and says, well, hang on a sec. Um, if you go on believing you're, you're naughty, uh, you know, this core fear might come true. You might get rejected by your tribe. So what happens is we create an, an equally, uh, you know, destructive overcompensating belief. It's like a different persona. So we have on the one hand, our shadow uh, core destructive belief. That's our dark side, if you like. And then on the other hand, we have this overcompensating belief. Um, this, the shadow's positive twin. So my one was, you know, well, I'm, I become the teacher's pet. You know, I'm the good girl at school. So uh, driven by this fear of getting into trouble, I would do everything to make my teacher happy, my parents happy. You know, I'd be getting perfect scores in tests. I'd be the prefect in the class. I was even the milk monitor of all things. But of course, because each of these positions requires so much energy, we vacillate between the two. We don't, it's not a constant. It's a, it's a, it's a feeling of, uh, you know, a tug of war or a crazy pendulum. And unfortunately, because part of us gets addicted to the, this uh, negative emotion or shame, we get pulled towards it. But um, as, we, as we grow, instead of the crime being committed against us, we start to be become the perpetrators of the crime. So, um, so this crazy loop played out for me many, many times in my life. But to share with you probably the most dramatic example, uh, was uh, I was two years into my uh, relationship uh, with my husband. We've been married 40 years, but um, prior to us getting married, we'd been together two years and I had a one night stand. And uh, having that uh, one night stand didn't make any sense to me at all. I had no idea. I was being driven by this core destructive belief of I'm naughty. This, this destructive belief is very tied into the temptress archetype if any of you are familiar with those archetypes, uh, you know, so this uh, uh, sense of, you know, being um, a seductress in a way. Um, and of, of course, but the, the one night stand in itself was absolutely meaningless, but it had the effect once again of creating a terrible sense of shame. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror the, the morning after going, you know, who the hell are you? You know, I, I, I just, I, I just saw a stranger, someone I didn't relate to. And it was so devastating to our relationship that basically uh, we, we got married, but we swept it under the rug of our marriage. We never talked about it. And what I did, um, you know, driven again, remembering this crazy pendulum, I went straight over to the prison of my overcompensating self. So this time, instead of being locked in my bedroom, I basically hid myself away behind a desk for the best part of 30 years just trying to be the perfect wife and the perfect mother and then the perfect business owner. We ran um, six different businesses. Um, and, but in the process, I was burying myself. And this, this just played out over and over and over again. So just see if you relate uh, to that. Um, what I came to realise, uh, you know, I reached a point in my life where something had to, uh, to break. And so I was very fortunate um, to finally uh, let go of all these businesses, which were basically just facades, it wasn't who I was, um, and do the work that I feel genuinely passionate about. And that's the work that I'm doing now. And I really set as my mission to find out, you know, what is this mental termite 
that uh, that caused me such uh, misery in my life, you know, to, to lose nearly all the money that we spent 30 years working so hard to gain. Uh, for me to feel at the end of it, like I was absolutely worthless, all that work, and just to end up feeling unfulfilled and empty. What was that all about? So I was determined to find out what this mental termite was. And I thought if I can solve the puzzle of myself, I can help other people solve their puzzle as well and reach a different level of understanding. Uh, and with that understanding coming to a state of self-acceptance and ultimately self-love. But uh, for me, it was all about finding out this mental termite. So it, it was this thing that was at the, uh, the, the root cause of all the things going wrong in my life, which was your core destructive belief. And we all have one. So the question I, um, I had to ask myself was, well, what if there were a process for identifying and deactivating your core destructive belief? Uh, you know, uh, is there a way of actually uh, finding out what this is without having to go through, you know, all the pain that I went through? You know, I spent 30 years, you know, what if there was a way to actually help others identify their core destructive belief uh, in a much shorter time frame? And so, um, fortunately, I've spent many years in advertising um, as a creative strategist. And so I think very much in terms of linear process, you know, step by step, rather than things that are open ended. And so this is what I came up with, and I call it pain to passion. And so essentially, what it means is that uh, in order to for us to get what we want in life, and if you like run to the light, we first have to confront our fears um, and go to our dark side. So this is where the shadow comes comes in. And as we do that, we move into our unconscious self. We have to go into our unconscious self and, and there are ways of accessing that. And the reason we must access, is, access it is we have to identify these key elements. So we have to identify our core fear, our core destructive belief, our CDB, and what I call our OPB, our overcompensating positive belief, because you, uh, everyone who's watching this, um, know this about you, that you are operating between these two polarities, uh, even though you might not be aware of it. But what's very interesting is that once you bring this awareness to your conscious self, you, you actually move into the light. So by exposing these beliefs to the light and actually making them conscious, automatically they start to lose their sting. We start to disarm them. And we, we realize the truth behind the stories. And these actually become your messages going forward. And from this position, when we can actually integrate our dark and our light, we, we arrive at a state of oneness. And in that state of oneness, uh, we finally go from a position of freeze to freedom and all the benefits that come with that. So that's really just what I wanted to share with you in this video, that if you are feeling stuck, you know, if you are feeling like you're dragging this giant weight behind you and you don't know what it is, well, it's true, you are dragging a giant weight. It's your pain body, it stays in your body. Uh, some people describe it as weighing as much as 20, 30 kilos. Uh, we all have it, so don't feel that you're only, the only one on the planet. And there is actually a process for identifying that and bringing it to the light. And as soon as you do, you go from this state of feeling terribly uh, uh, stuck and like there's a piece of you that's missing and, and life just feels a bit off going from that to a place where you are genuinely free. And life and everything from that point suddenly starts to work. And I have to say, it's such a wonderful place to be that that's exactly uh, why I am so uh, passionate to share this process with as many people I can, because just seeing the transformation in every single person makes my life worthwhile. So uh, thank you very much for watching this video. And I wish you um, all the best with your personal journey into your inner self. It's one that's very, very well worth taking. Thank you.